Hey everyone, Sean Paul Ellis here from Saturday Morning Cartoons. Remember, that's morning with a U. Thank you for listening, and before we start today's show, we have to tell you about a special project that we've been working on, and you can check it out right now for free. Myself, SMC co-host Dave Trumbor, and friends of the show Allison Keene and Alex Kazanis have put together a comic for you called Death Jr., what is Death Jr.? Think of it as part Charles Schultz's Peanuts comic strip, South Park, and a lot of morbid humor. We've had a blast with this, and you can read a new comic strip every weekday in January by going to our Twitter, at Death Junior Comics, on the web, DeathJuniorComics.com, and you can even check out our current Instagram, which has been taken over with Death Junior this month, at Saturday Morning Cartoons. We hope you enjoy it and share the hell out of it. Pun intended. Hey everyone, Sean and Dave here from Saturday Morning Cartoons. We cannot start this week's show, absolutely cannot start this week's show, until we thank the following people who went to Patreon.com to sponsor this show. Derek Haynes. Alex Kazanis. Jack Connolly. Jonathan Renteria Elie. Bill Dixon. The wonderful Melanie Harker. Dr. Jason Woods. Oh, the fantastic Allison Keene. The all right Jamal Newman. The so-so John Helter. Battle Matt Fitness. The wonderful David Trumbor. And the one and only Sean Paul Ellis. Hey, out there, if you guys want to be on this list or just want to know what's coming up next week on the show, check out patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons for more details. And remember, that's morning with a U. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. Thank you so much for listening. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the weekly podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated series. Coming to you from the distant future, I'll be your co-host, Dave Trumbor. Joining me as always, my co-host and fellow time cop, it's Sean Paul Ellis. How's it going, bud? Uh, David, David, David. I'm doing well, buddy. How about yourself? I'm doing great. You've been working on your splits, time cop? Ooh, trying. Trying Jean- to. Jean-Claude Van Damme time cop splits. Yep. All I do is second you said Time Cop, yep. and the second I heard Time Cop in this, I was just like, oh my God, Van Damme is probably having a panic attack somewhere, <laughs> thinking that he could have had an animated Time Cop cartoon. Yeah, so to all our listeners out there who were like hoping that we have somehow discovered a JCVD animated series, no, the search continues. <laughs> we're, we're pretty close. No, we're not close at all. We're not close at all with that tonight. Uh, <laughs> JCVD sidetrack here for a second uh friend of the show also my girlfriend allison keen and i were just like randomly name drop name drop (laughs) i'm important uh we're just like randomly channel surfing and we came across the bounce network and there was a tell me if you can name this movie it's obviously a 90s movie okay jean claude van damme executive decision (laughs) what come on i don't know all in denim with a mullet um Directed by John Woo because there were doves flying everywhere in slow motion in like okay. a factory fight scene. Uh, also starring Wilfred Brimley on a horse <laughs> firing what? a bow and arrow. Stop it. While a helicopter zoomed down a river chasing Jean Claude Van Damme on horseback. Uh, oh my God. This is killing me because I don't know what it is, but is this the one where he's trying to prevent like an oil company from drilling in like Alaska? I have no fucking clue. Are you, th- are you thinking of Steven Seagal? I hope you're not thinking of Steven Seagal. I'm always thinking of Steven Seagal. <laughs> we are always thinking of Steven Seagal. Here, <laughs> Wait, they're two different people? Thoughts and prayers. I would much prefer to think of JCVD. Hard Target. For your listeners out there playing along, Hard Target. <laughs> Look it up on the Bounce Network, apparently. Playing at a satellite TV near you. Because what you want to do is whenever you pull up a Jean-Claude Van Damme, you want to go to the Bounce Network. Because if you're thinking of action, think Bounce. Bounce. Think bounce. I don't even know well, how the, I found it. I think guys, I think, this week we're sponsored by Bounce Network. <laughs> they went defunct in like 1998, but somehow my satellite uh, is still picking it up. I'm not how old is sure your fucking story. satellite? I bought it in 1998. Why? Also, why do you have a personal satellite that just shows <laughs> you John Claude Van Damme movies? Ah, fair enough. Uh, I never pass up a good deal. 
This said, 100% guaranteed lifetime subscription to Bounce Network and all the JCVD movies <laughs> you can ask for. I'm still waiting for like a late night animated series, but it hasn't shown up yet. Fair I enough. mean, Chuck Norris got one. Friggin' Wayne Gretzky sort of had one. Yeah. They're not even close to being related, but I feel like, you know, JCVD's in there somewhere. He's got to have his own animated series, right? I, I mean, even Stallone. Even Stallone had he Rambo did. the animated series. He had Rambo so, the animated series. Which Sergeant I Slaughter cannot wait to. Series. Yeah, and he even had a he even like introed GI Joe episodes for a long time. Yeah, and he creepily appeared on an episode of Super Mario Brothers Super Show, which I found myself watching the other day. Who <laughs> didn't cameo on that fucking show? <sighs> you know who did? Nicole Eggert. That's right. And and Danica McKellar. She went to a uh, was it a, a she went to a, a sloppy party? S- sloppy party. Gross. Yeah. Gross guys. Gross, but I'm also intrigued. Yeah. I'm also intrigued. Uh, I'm going to go to Urban Dictionary. I'm what? What? Hold on. Urban Dictionary. Let's back up. I just want to go to Urban Dictionary, and I want to figure out what a sloppy party is. Nope. Please do not tweet what a sloppy party is to me. Or do. Definitely do. Uh, you know, this actually reminds me. We used to do a thing here on Saturday Morning Cartoons, and we haven't done it for years, if not decades. But uh, <laughs> we used to, when talking about a cartoon at the end of the show, would see if it was on Rule 34. We would say, is this show Rule 34? And invariably, the answer came back, yes, and don't look it up. It was pretty much our response. We stopped doing that somewhere along the way. Yeah, I feel like to feel like we matured a little Did bit you know? as a... No, not at all. That was a total lie. And you called me out, and I folded like a house of cards. Both of them. Folded like a house of cards that have uh, perverted things on the inside of those cards. I think we just forgot about it, but I'd like to maybe start doing that in the future. If you're listening out there and you'd like us to bring back Rule 34, uh, let us know, and we will do the dirty work for oh. you and, and look up. Oh, Sean will look it up. And oh, let you know if, God if damn it. Every ep- I think what happened was- we That's got actually, to, yeah, this is 100- we got I know exactly like why Rainbow we stopped. Bright, and we were like, oh. <laughs> And we, we did not want that in our search history or our incognito browser. I've thrown away so it. many laptop computers because yeah. of Rule 34 searches. Just rip the hard drive right out of there while it's running. Toss it. Yikes. Breaking Bad style. Anyway, yeah. nothing to do with Rule 34 because we didn't look it up tonight. <laughs> uh, at least I didn't. I did, and it qualifies. Well, there you go. So there's your answer, kids. Time Squad brought to us uh. by a user we can't remember on Twitter who told us to check it out. When we have some time. Thanks, bud. We had the time. We had the time, and we checked it out. We didn't have the time to write your name down, but we do <sighs> appreciate your effort. We're terrible people. <laughs> Sean, what's up, what's up with Time Squad? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So Time Squad is an American children's animated television series created by Dave Wasson for Cartoon Network and the 10th of the network's cartoon cartoons. Uh, Wasson described the series as a C student's guide to history, which is perfect, because guess what? I'm terrible at history. The series premiered during Cartoon Network's marathon block Cartoon Cartoon Summer in June of 2001 and ended after two seasons in November of 2003, airing 26 episodes total. In the course of its run, the series received five Annie Award nominations. That was kind of surprising. I didn't look up specifically what they were for, but... It's it's interesting. There's hold on. What do you? Show. Yeah. Pause real quick. What do you think the Annie Awards are then? What do you mean? I'm assuming they have different categories, right? Yeah, but like, what do what do you think the An like the Annie Awards in general? I just want to like just hot take off the top of your head, buddy. Uh, best Rule Thirty Four page. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, largest God, so... animated pixels. Okay. Well, I'm just going to cut you off right there. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> no, uh, the Annie Awards, uh, they're just for accomplishments in animation. Right. So, so just, like, just like technical or like artistic? Uh, it's actually, it's for both. It, they have like best animated feature, best uh, general audience, um, animated television production, best production for children, oh, okay. best for preschool children, best short subject, even television commercial. And so... You know, they have anything there from animated effects as well to, to music and directing. And so uh, it's sort of the, the Emmys, or I'm sorry, it's the Academy Awards, sure. but specifically for animation accomplishments. Yeah, I mean, even Emmys are probably closer because they do for, uh, for TV as well. So um, it's interesting, though, because there were, a, there were a lot of superlatives, I think, for this show. 
but it was kind of underrated in its time. It was it was one of these things that just kind of passed by. And the fact that it, it only ran for 26 episodes, you could easily miss this one uh, in 2001, 2003. There was kind of a lot of stuff going on in 2001 to 2003. Who the wasn't there? Yeah, so this one could have been easily missed. I'm, I'm kind of thankful that our Twitter follower um, suggested it to us. But if you're not familiar with Time Squad, like we were not, as far as I know, here's what it's about. So Time Squad follows the adventures of Otto Osworth, Buck Tud Russell, and the robot Larry <laughs> 3000, a trio of hapless time cops living in the far distant future who travel back in time attempting to correct the course of history. During their adventures, they run into major historical figures such as Julius Caesar, Abraham Lincoln, Sigmund Freud, Leonardo da Vinci, the Founding Fathers, and Montezuma, who have taken a drastically different course of life than history dictates. The mission of the Time Squad is to guide these figures onto the correct path and ensure the integrity of the future. And whether they achieve that or not in each episode is kind of <laughs> up for debate. Super debatable. But it was such a, that's a really cool premise, actually. It, it reminded yeah. me, at least from this logline, it reminded me of, uh, what was it, America's Kids? A kind of like American history-themed PBS right. show. Except minus the actual education. Yes. And if you were to add in a lot of tropes and jokes. Tropes and jokes and robots. <laughs> and yeah. which, which I'm 100% on board with. No, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was, it, from the log line, I was like, oh, this is going to be a silly educational show that's some, something like America's Kids meets Peabody and Sherman. That's kind of what that's, I thought it would be. It, it's ex- I, so I thought that it was something along the lines of Peabody and Sherman uh, plus me in a history class and a robot. I mean, that's actually probably pretty damn close. Which, which is like, there's the time travel element. There's some poor educational process and understanding in terms of how history and time works. Yeah. And then followed off with a robot. And Brock from Venture Brothers. Where are the boys? <laughs> <laughs> Jupacabra. Mexico's crawling with them. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. Have you ever met a time traveler? Uh, no. Have you? I'm not sure. I think it's really whoa, hard. Whoa, whoa, what? I think it's hard to know if you've met a time traveler. Okay. Right? Because I think when I was a kid, this is going to turn into like, a, oh, no, you need to go talk to a professional. Story. Yeah, pretty much. This always does. Yeah. When I was a kid, me and my friends were outside playing like, I don't know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or whatever. And we had like, I was always Donatello because he's obviously the best. Don't at me. I don't want to hear it. He's the best. <laughs> but I had like, a, like a, a bamboo stick or like a corn stalk or something that I had like turned into a bow staff. So I was spinning around like a little idiot kid as you do. Anyway, this dude comes like out of nowhere, probably like older teenager, young adult, 20s kind of thing, and did like, he just grabbed it and like started doing all these cool like bow staff moves, like Napoleon Dynamite. And we were all just like, what? And then he was just like, handed it back and then walked away. So we were all just like, little kid, mind blown. And we were just like, oh, let's go track that guy down. He can teach us those moves. So we ran up the street to where he had gone and he was gone, man. He's disappeared. Wow. He wasn't in the corner store. He didn't get in a car. He wasn't across the street. He didn't go in anybody's house. He was poof, gone. No shit. Gone. Time traveler. Gotta be. Wow. And that's it. I, the, you know, I, uh, I was outside and Arnold Schwarzenegger just showed up naked one day yeah. and like a ball of energy. Yeah. And I didn't even think that was weird. I was like, I just assumed that that's how Arnold Schwarzenegger travels. That's kind now. of how he travels. Yeah. yeah. I figured that's just. He just shows up naked and he just asked me a bunch of questions and I was like, here, have, have, have this pullover, have my hoodie and these sunglasses. Yeah. I mean, that's like, out actually. Yeah. And he, he, he legitimately was very kind about it. He's like, you know, you're not my size. And I was like, okay, well, you know, don't, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, asshole. Yeah. And then he just took it. You know, all you have to do, guys, pro tip, all you have to do is call Schwarzenegger an asshole and he'll just take any gift you give him. He will. And then he'll leave naked. <laughs> Or clothed in whatever you gave him. Yeah, it was weird that I gave him a hoodie and a pair of sunglasses, but no pant That's bottoms. No, <laughs> kind of just... rode up, if I remember correctly. <laughs> just all in the wind. Yep. That's Schwarzenegger. What are you going to do? God. Did so, you spe- know? Speaking of theme songs. Did, did you? Well, I want to ask, yeah, yeah. first and foremost, did you know about this show that it existed? You know, no. If you would have asked me Time Squad, it was a show about this and this and this, I would have been like, it doesn't ring a bell. I don't know. But if you would have shown me a picture of it, I somewhere in my mind remember seeing at least Buck 
Like he looked really recognizable for some reason. I don't know why, right. but uh, I was just like, oh, I have seen this. How about you? I will. I will say I do remember this show faintly. This was on during that time when Cartoon Network was. They had kind of gotten past that like very late '90s portion yeah. of Johnny Bravo, Cow and Chicken, Too um, Ed, 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 yeah, all like all, uh, yeah, exactly. And so they had they had so many good things that were kind of going, and then they they kind of ventured into sort of these like the cartoons began to mature along with me as I was watching them, which I was like, that's crazy because they kept hitting on like some of these interesting topics that we'll we'll talk about tonight. But I remember uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends right. when it came out. And there, I saw some similarities in this show and in Foster's. Right. And it was, it was very interesting. And so I remember, uh, and we'll talk about it in sort of the, the animation style, as well as also some of the, the character design that they had. Uh, a lot of parallels just kind of really matched up. And I remembered this cartoon out, and I was watching Foster's all the time. And I don't know how I missed this show because it was a lot of fucking fun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll, we'll get into that as we talk about this, but I had never watched Fosters, but I was very familiar with like sort of the characters, the premise, and then definitely that view of the house with the sign out front kind of thing, right? which is something that we see in this. So it was in interesting this. to see the, the comparison. And, and these were out around the same time. Right. So these are contemporaries on the same exact network, right. uh, which is bananas. But let's talk about the blemish of this show it wasn't honestly it was more of a blip than a blemish for me because it was just so fast it was gone yeah, and done and not memorable like 23 seconds long yeah. there's, a, there's an extended song. version but it's not any different it's just a longer version of the same thing you get for 20 <laughs> seconds so it's just that 20 seconds just cut and looped over and over I'm again to make it a whole minute it's not even a joke that's like basically true yeah it, it's just there's no lyrics there's no roll call there's no original animation it's just a clip show and kind of electro rock and it's fine it's got like okay riffs i could not hum it for you or, or tell you what it sounded like here but it's short and it gets you right into it so yeah it's not like a great lead-in you know we were talking offline about like steven universe or something like adventure time comes to mind those theme songs at least the snippets that they cut down of them are fairly short but they're super like hyper memorable and they do a great job of introducing the shows this didn't have it. This was like an afterthought to me. It was just kind of like not even worth, <laughs> not even worth talking about or including in the in the series if you are gonna do that. So no, I agree. Yeah. This uh, there was nothing memorable about this, yeah. and for such a good show yeah. and and the content and and these three main characters that we're gonna get introduced to, there's a lot going on, and I feel like they could have put some thought into it. I would have loved to have seen some thought. But honestly, I think the benefit that you mentioned or the biggest pro for being such a short afterthought of a theme song is that it is insane. It's 22 seconds yeah. in length and it, it goes by in a snap and then you're into the fun. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, and especially because the way that these are formatted is a little strange. We're used to like the 22, 24 episode format broken down right. into two 11 or 12 minute segments. This was broken into like one 15-minute cartoon and one seven-minute cartoon, which was a little strange. But maybe that was just for this first episode. Maybe not all the things had quite lined up. But uh, let's talk about the animation style, I think, next. What jumped out at you about uh, Time Squad here as far as animation goes? You know, uh, really simple, clean lines. Nothing was too bold or crazy, except for maybe like specific jaw lines on... On uh, Buck Tud Russell. On Buck Tud Russell, uh, you can't say Buck Tud Russell without doing that voice. I, I try. It. If you're if you're somebody who's like Buck Tud Russell, Ooh, you're like man, actually, yeah, it's just not. It's just not. It's not fun. That's like not, I didn't. It sounds very fun to me. <laughs> but but when I say when I hear it in my brain, my brain is saying it's, it's like Buck Tud, Tud Russell. Russell, and then like I sit down and I watch Roadhouse. I and sit I'm drinking down real it. hard. I sit down real hard in a, in a lazy boy. <laughs> Watch Roadhouse and then, co- <laughs> yeah, and then and then complain about all the vocal burn. <laughs> <laughs> Sean's having a rough time. What I love about this though is this guy is voiced by Rob Paulson, who you guys probably yeah. know from like Animaniacs, and it's such a completely other end of the spectrum voice that that's amazing to me, just like that range that he had. I'm sure he loved the fact that he got to kind of put on this gruff kind of Texan tough guy voice. But uh, at the same so time, good. it was just the other 
end of the spectrum from it. So pretty cool. Uh, so really clean lines, uh, not a ton of like shading or yeah. shadow, or depth, surprising, but, but they did a good job with getting around that. And I think in part, the shading and the depth that was present was actually in the background. And that's actually what I loved was that the background almost kind of looked like watercolor mm. uh, or, or just like it was very simple colors for like some of the houses and the background. Uh, I don't know. There, there was one moment in particular in one of the episodes where I, I really began paying attention to it. And it almost became a focal point to me where I, I, I knew that it was grass up against the side mm. of a building. And I, I thought for two seconds, I was like, eh, that kind of that looks like they kind of haphazardly lazily painted that and i was like i can appreciate that uh, from one lazy person to another but then the more i stared at it i was like no this is actually really beautiful like i really do like this uh and that's kind of what gave it a little bit of depth for me See, that's interesting because nothing about the animation style apart from the design of the characters which i really liked and the sort of simple one color background when i say one color i mean for different elements like a building was all purple or all tan you know, there was one tan building next to one purple one or in front of it. So everything was just kind of washed out in one color in order to fade into the background. But to me, there wasn't anything, there wasn't anything that like captured my attention or stood out as particularly interesting. It just looked, it looked clean. It looked very two-dimensional, sort of like paper cutouts on a paper cutout background. And that was enough to give just a little bit of a hint of separation and depth to make the characters kind of like pop forward and, and pop out. Um, I will say that they did add a little bit of variety briefly. There's a moment where the characters kind of go on this this computer and they kind of cycle through almost like an old uh, film reel or a slide projector. They cycle through a bunch of different pictures from history, and they're like basically uh, historical images or photographs that you'd find in a in a textbook, right? Right. Or or paintings or whatever depictions of certain events or people from history that happened. So that was kind of a cool nod, a, a cool thing that they added in. They didn't necessarily like recreate historical figures in this little uh, slideshow, but they did once we introduced uh, them in the plot itself. So I thought it was fine. I thought it was a nice, a nice palette. I actually really like Buck's palette and, and Larry's palette as well. They're kind of like, yeah, they're a little dirty. They're a little dingy. They're kind of earthy. They're not, they look kind of super heroic from their design. But they also look but their very colors unkempt. Not. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that unkept. I thought that was cool. Unkempt, unkempt, and unkept. No one's keeping unkept. them. Unkept. No one's camping them. No one's keeping them. No one's keeping. No more keeping. Guys, stop keeping. Oh God, they don't like it. Just leave them alone. Don't at me. I don't want to hear about your unkemptness. That's right. Let's get into these characters since we're talking about them here. Uh, who's your Who's your favorite buddy? Uh, I really like Buck Ted Russell. Buck Ted Russell. Yeah. So, I mean, I love, uh, like you've said, the, the character design. I love sort of like the Cyclops yeah. X-Men style visor that he has. He's got this unbelievable, like, double-barreled chest. Yeah. He's uh, like really, that's really sort good of, man from Rocco. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it, it, like, sort of the, the stubble that you see that that's under great. the mask. I love that. For some reason, it reminded me of, like, a Judge Dredd. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like a judge. He was like Dredd a time cop shade. judge dread. Exactly. And I love that yeah. because it, it's an interesting um it's an interesting trait on a character, but also for somebody who looks like he should be a superhero, you know, Superman, uh, all the all these big kind of like brawny guys, they're always clean shaven because it's always like the, you know, the the boy scout, the big blue boy scout, the clean shaven American whatever jaw. That was cool to see just like a whole face like our buddy Reuter, like his whole face just if he doesn't constantly shave every second of the day, <laughs> it just grows. He's like a chia pet. Yeah. So I thought that was yeah. interesting. It was a, that was a cool, uh, cool addition. Because it, it yeah, adds really... to his, it informs on his character though too. He's like capable and he's tough and he's a good fighter, but he's kind of a mess otherwise. Yeah. I would have loved for just like a Buck Tud Russell series where it's just like him doing like everyday household stuff like doing chores and running errands and paying bills. And he'd be like, oh, but why would he <laughs> like do that when he's got punching a checkbook? <laughs> like, literally just punching out. Yeah. But why would he do that when he's got Larry 3000 around to fetch him a drink? Take was Larry your, was Larry your favorite character? I like Larry mostly because Mark Hamill. Right. I mean, and, and guys, it is Mark Hamill. And who, if you are not familiar with his, his work as a voice actor, I mean, obviously you know him and you love him as Luke Skywalker, but oh my God, just 
it, it felt like it was a Joker. Yes, a Joker bot. Yeah, Joker bot. And I loved Joker bot. Yeah. What a great robot. <laughs> just to hear that, just to hear that voice animated in a different style that's not the Joker. It did take me a couple seconds just because I know his voice so well. Right. Because I mean, when it came up and like I had done no prior research, I came into right. this cartoon cold. And the second I heard this, I was like, oh my God, that's Mark Hamill. Yeah. Different it, different for Paulson. I never would have guessed in a million years this was Rob Paulson. But yeah. for Hamill, it's immediate. Right. But what was interesting was he did a great job of, you know, it's Hamill's voice and you recognize it, but it's not the Joker. You know, it's not that performance. It's very different. So Larry's kind of this disgruntled robot who's paired up with Buck for whatever reason. We don't know why. They don't really get along all that well. They're kind of always at loggerheads. And it, you find out very quickly that Larry was basically like an etiquette bot, right? Like he's more of a C-3PO type. So right. he's supposed to be kind of sophisticated and suave, and he's supposed to negotiate between diplomats of different countries. He knows, you know, 3,000 languages or whatever the deal is. But we learned that basically sometime in the history since Larry was made, all the nations of Earth have kind of unified into one mega nation, And... Larry's kind of now like he's defunct. They don't need him anymore. Everybody speaks the same language. There's no need to negotiate treaties or anything between nations. I thought that was an interesting thing to add in for his character, especially for a story that has nothing really to do with that. So it was right. sort of like, were they getting to something bigger? Was there going to be a bigger kind of story uh, in place here? Because as Sean and I were talking about, again, offline, this, this show feels very episodic. Each little segment is its own self-contained story, and it doesn't really necessarily connect to anything else. At least it doesn't feel that way from the first uh, episode that we watched. So, right. But no, I like Larry. He's um, he's fun. He's kind of the he takes a lot of the damage because he's a robot, so he can take it. He doesn't really dish anything out. He kind of runs away at the first sign of trouble. So yeah, he really seems to be a a, a scaredy cat yeah. and sort of a pacifist. Yes. Which I don't is, even know a pacifist. I think more like self-preservation. Like I think he yeah. <laughs> he'll step in and try to like diplomatically like cool things down, but then he'll just get like literally torn apart and had to have. It's to just weird. Up. It's just bizarre to hear the Joker voice yeah. and just be like, "Well, I've got to get out of here right now." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're like, "Okay, robot. Okay, Robo okay. Joker. Get out of here, Jokerbot." What about uh, what about Otto? What do you think about Orphan Otto? Um, I liked him. I, I liked that he was sort of the. Yeah, you know, he's the he's the audience stand in, right. you know, and for kids who are watching this, it's it's that sort of imaginative uh element where they can see themselves in this cartoon and they can have fun with it and you know, he's he he's he's small, he's he's tiny. He's an orphan. <laughs> little he's an orphan. They really Oof. they really put some backstory in this which is just kind of sad. You know what though? I'll take it because after Jimmy Neutron, a kid that we all hated everybody hated him. We could not get behind this kid's adventures because he was such a dick to everybody around him. Otto is like the exact opposite of that. He's like a smart, yeah. capable kid. He he means well. He just wants to be left alone to read. Um, yeah. But he's an orphan with like an overbearing nun. Uh, and he's not putting, an, an, unlike Jimmy Neutron, he's not putting his friends in danger. Right. He's trying to in help. In fact, yeah, he's trying to help them. He's always trying to help them. And this is uh, the voice actress for this is uh was it, it's Pam Adlin. Adlin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pamela Adlin. Guess what? She also does the voice of Bobby on King of the Hill. How about what? that? Man, we should yeah. talk about that sometime, huh? We should eventually. We should get to that. We get to wink. That. wink. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge wink, listener wink. appreciation. Uh so yeah, it, it's just uh, to have Pamela Adlin. She's also uh she's on better things. She was on Louie. Yeah. Uh, she was on Lucky Louie. I mean, she's just she's a fan. She's a fantastic actress. Funny, yeah. Uh yeah, super funny. But just to hear her voice, I was like, I knew it was her yeah. after the the Mark Hamill reveal for me. But it's great because she's got a voice. She's just such a great voice actress that this didn't feel like I was watching a Joker bot character. It felt like a Robert Paulson performance in this, where it's sure. like something in the same vein but almost completely different. Like I'm I'm glad that she had fun and that it was that ing- indistinguishable. Yeah. And that when I found out who it was, I was like, oh. Yeah, of course, duh. And I really, she's great. I liked it too because I actually liked this kid. The kid is kind of the brains of the operation, which is funny right. because you have a super advanced robot and this time cop who's supposed to be like the end all be all for all the adventures that they go on. But no, it's this little orphan kid who's just like, I know history. I'll help you guys out. And he's yeah, you know, 
he's he's the one that kind of pieces everything back together once it goes all pear shaped, which it does very quickly. Um, let's get into the plot. What do you think? Yeah, let's do this. I, I think this one had me from the title, right? So the title really? of the first segment of this one was Eli Whitney's <laughs> Flesh Eating Mistake. And if that doesn't grab your attention and just be like, wait, what? Uh, I don't know what's going to. Because <laughs> Eli Whitney, famous, I, th- I think, 18th century inventor, uh, invented the cotton gin. If you know that from history class and can remember that, then that makes this particular episode all the funnier. Uh, because what happens is the time squad is responsible for sort of correcting errors in time. So things that go awry, things that go not the way that they're supposed to, they have to go back and correct them in whatever way they can figure out. But the problem is they're very bad at their job. And they kind of need Otto in order to help them out. But how do they how do these guys all meet up? It's not like they're paired up in a team to begin with. How does how does this all start off? Sure. So uh, we mentioned the whole aspect of Otto wanting to just really read and kind of be by himself. Yeah, in the orphanage. And yeah, in this orphanage and uh, Sister Thornley has kind of punished him for the fact that he was reading. Good rule of three here with this joke. They have him like shoveling coal, fixing a car tire, and then cleaning a bathroom where another kid walks out of it and just goes, good luck, jerk. And you're like, oh boy. So end of the day, Otto finally gets back to his room. You know, it, it's one of those things where it, it, it's good storytelling because it's like every day this happened right. until one day this incredible thing happened to Otto, which is he's in his room and there's like a crack of lightning yeah. in what looks like a storage facility area that he's like sleeping on yeah, a cot in. like in. a basement of like, yeah, like a storage closet, yeah. And, and all of a sudden we've got Buck Tud Russell and Larry 3000 I keep wanting to say Andre 3000. I, I know I, it's not Andre Call. 3000. His name might be Andre. My middle it name could be Andre. <laughs> Lawrence Andre 3000. It's possible. Uh, yeah, possible. So we, we have these two characters, these, this time squad, uh, show up, and they immediately think that they are in the 18th century and that they are, uh, like, and Buck is ready to attack and fight. Anything. Eli, yeah. Eli Whitney, or whoever is there at this point. With his and so, taser or his phaser? He's got a taser yeah, and a phaser. and a phaser. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, this, is, this is how this happens. And it's just like, it's just crazy because in that instant, all of a sudden, Otto's, like, what looks to be in what the picture that's been painted of this just terrible life where he's just spit upon and looked down upon is now changed Hopefully for the better. You don't really know what the outcome is going to be, but obviously this wouldn't be Time Squad unless suddenly this this uh, this orphan kid has to join this this actual squad. Well, let so me, let me ask which, you this though: for like for me personally, every time right. in the middle of the night that a grown man and a robot have spontaneously appeared in my room, I always just kind of like point them in the right direction and be like, "Now nah, you got the wrong guy again. Here's where you want to go." But I've never said like, "Hey." I can actually join up and help out, which I guess is my oversight. But for you, I'm sure this opportunity has come up a number of times. Why are you not currently yeah. on a time squad? Uh, or, I mean, I or am, and it's because, uh, because I'm quick, uh, quick on my feet with words. With words. We'd like to thank with Sean words. for taking time out of his time squad duties to pop in every Monday. Monday night? It's not. Wednesday night? Yeah. <laughs> what day of the week Wednesday is this night? for you? It's Wednesday, Dave. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, it, it's fun to it's fun to see this because it, in this moment with all of the commotion that's happening yep. in this storage closet, uh, Sister Thornley comes down and, and and starts banging on the door. And this is the moment where you know suddenly we have Otto kind of snap into it. He's able to to uh, well, because Buck's about to tase fear, him. Yeah, yeah, right. Buck's like, I'll take care <laughs> of it. And we're like, no, no, please don't tase the nun, <laughs> even though she's terrible. And so Otto is able to to quickly communicate with her and just be like, "I'm not doing anything. Don't worry about it. I was I was fixing like the toilet brush, yeah. you know, from from earlier." And she's like, "All right, we'll do it. Do it quieter. Do it. Do it quieter. Yeah. We'll just do it quieter." Uh, you know. And so then, and Buck immediately is just like, "You know, you're quick. Uh, quick on your feet with your words," which seemed to be something that Buck doesn't get. And you you get a little bit of a an idea in terms of you know. Uh, Larry 3000 because you you find out pretty quickly that like he's not programmed for any of like the history stuff that he's supposed to to help with and so 
in the in this moment, Otto's like, I'm gonna parlay this into like a full time job here yeah, to get yeah. the fuck out of this horror for Otto in his Harry Potter moment there, man. He got oh right God. out of that room closet <laughs> and just like zoop. You're a wizard now, Otto. You're a time cop, Harry. <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty good for Otto and better for the show because they just get right into it. They're like they yeah. introduce Otto, they introduce these guys, you know what they're about, even if you don't know all the backstory, and boom. They're off to find out what's up with Eli Whitney. Now, for me, yeah. when you hear, like, we're going to go mess up Eli Whitney because he's been screwing with time, like, what can bro who's invented the cotton gin, like, what could he possibly have done? Uh, what in what turns out, world could he have done? Yeah. Turns out he could have done a lot of harm. Apparently, yeah, horrible things. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's created actual flesh-eating robots. And not just, like, a handful of them, like an army of them. Yeah. To which... He seems when you meet when you actually meet Eli Whitney the character, yeah. he seems rather proud of his invention and what he's been able to create. And he's fascinated by the fact that he's visited by another robot, Larry Three Thousand, and he's like, "What? What kind of? What kind of? Like, what kind of? Do you eat brains? Why would Eli? Eli doesn't seem super smart on the uptake either, because he's just like, oh, I just made a bunch of brains, or made a bunch of brains, made a bunch of robots that eat flesh <laughs> to to help humanity." And they're like, "How does that work?" He's like, "I don't know. I didn't think about it." Like, all yeah, right, it's I love I love the idea of this sort of alternative history yep. and these people just sort of half assing their way. Oh my god. And then, you know, at some point, like, you know, they, they have that epiphany or they have that stroke of genius moment where they create something revolutionary, right. uh, which is fantastic. But in the meantime, it takes you have them to think a about a long time to get to that point though. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and you think for any inventor, like, you know, the the series of fuck ups that you have to get. Right. The series of stew pickles moments that you have to get until you get to like that actual you know moment where you're like oh I've got like a I've got an MVP I've got a like a minim, a minimally viable product <laughs> that I can sell. One of my favorite examples of that is uh, the Simpsons episode where Homer tries to become an inventor, and he oh my god mm. the one that I just thought of was um, he holds up this contraption and and Marge is like Homer what is that. He's like, it's my artificial kidney. And they're like, no, that's just a beer can with a whistle tape to it. That fucking <laughs> killed me when I was a kid. I thought it was the funniest damn thing I'd ever heard. Because it's so bizarre and so uh, absurd. But he makes, he makes a bunch of inventions like that that are just like completely useless and nonsensical and they don't actually work. But then while he's doing it, he like, he's like leaning back on his chair and he loses his balance and he falls back, but then he stops. And Bart or Lisa is in there and they're like, whoa dad are you okay and he's like oh yeah it's this extra leg i put on the back of my chair to stop me from falling over it saved me and they're like hello like that's your invention like that's the thing like that's great hey, that's yo. brilliant it's a thing that works and then long... that bear horn exactly and then long story short uh his invention i think that chair ends up like in a museum for like thomas edison so edison gets credited with the uh the invention of a fifth legged chair or whatever it is but anyway I like that idea, but it's not its not really even at the forefront of this particular cartoon. Like, it's a nice thing to think about once you dig into it a little bit more. But on the surface, it's just super silly. It's Buck Tud Russell busting out of his, like, uh, his time travel, punching the shit out of a tree, and then getting attacked by a bunch of, like, irate farmers who are tired of being eaten by these <laughs> robots. So it's, like, super bizarre and very zany and silly. But it eventually gets to a point where Eli Whitney's like, oh, I should create a cotton seed separator thingy. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of cute that they bring it back around to like the actual history without hitting kids over the head with it. I thought that was neat. And, and it's so funny just to, to have that like Ada, Ada, I guess maybe like G moment where like they, they start out with these flesh eating robots to where these townspeople are just like, thank you so much, Otto, for saving everybody. Yes. Also, your shirt is so soft. It's like that Seinfeld moment where, like, you feel the fabric on yeah. somebody else's clothing. Like, that's a weird thing to do to somebody else. I don't care who you are, but, like, you don't just reach over and touch somebody and just be like, oh, I like your, I like your fabric. Like your shirt. Like that's your a fine I had that happen to me once. Somebody did that to me once in an elevator, and I was like, God. Damn. Unless you're Daniel Day Lewis or an actual tailor, I, that's. It's, why yeah. would you do it? Phantom Even then, Thread? just fucking ask. This you. episode sponsored by Phantom Thread, now in theaters near you. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I love though is that like Eli Whitney responsible for, for creating you know the cotton gin back in the day 18th century he made these like actual robot armies that they even had like a heads up display inside their brains 
that told them whether something was not flesh <laughs> or tasty flesh. And I love that. I love the fact that that was the thing that happened. That was, it's that was so silly. Cool. Yeah. yeah. The, the only problem I had with this episode was that at the end of it, Otto was just like, time to go home. And that's it. It just cuts out. Like there's no yeah. resolution beyond that. It's just, just like hard blackout yeah. right away. You're done. It's like, okay, Eli's back on track. Let's go home. And, and it would have been nice if he like, you know, had to part ways with these guys. We get to see that Buck's kind of space station, the, the time squad, the time cop headquarters is sort of the space station that looks like a bunch of hamster tubes all kind of like mushed together. Um, it's kind of futuristic, but it's also kind of like a knockoff Jetsons kind of thing. Like things kind of work, but at the same time, they don't really work the way they're probably supposed to be designed to work. Yeah, these guys don't it, know how to reminded, use it. it reminded me of like a, a like a like a piecemeal space station that was cobbled together, yeah. and then it was like furnished by like what my dad would have wanted in the 1980s. Yeah, it, it was a like, weird... oh, I got a I got a lazy boy chair. Somebody to bring me a nice cold beverage. Hold on, is your dad Buck Todd Russell? I I honestly wish he was a cartoon. <laughs> I feel that about <laughs> feel the way about most people, to be honest with you, and myself. So, so that episode didn't end, um, but we got to see that. It would have been cool if we got to see Otto like kind of say goodbye to these guys, or if he was going to be sort of adopted so he could live on the space station, or if he had to go back to the orphanage. But we didn't get that. I closer. just I assume that if you if you are a time squad yeah. and you warp a child to your space station that's just that's adoption that's papers child, in my no, book yeah. that's yeah it's, it's your find a child find a child take a child yeah. transport yeah. a child yeah 100 yeah. that's, that's how that's how ado- wait you're telling me that's how adoption doesn't you have work? to teleport a child that's how order. adoption works. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 100%. yeah. got it there's papers got and it. stuff but it's all red tape <laughs> It was interesting. Second I mean, they could have like they could have like deputized <laughs> okay. them though. You know what I mean? Like he could have had a little more yeah, official, I want, yeah, like a like a badge or yeah. like a welcoming ceremony. Something. Give him a phaser, whatever. You know, but at this point, you know, they're still they're still uh, they're still testing the water, and there's still seven minutes left in the episode. So yeah, right. They, they did not hook me with the second title, which is "Never Look a Trojan Horse in the Mouth," which is kind of kind of awkward. Well, it was never it was never look a Trojan in the gift horse. Oh, was it? Yeah, I thought so. Never look a Trojan in the... Neither of those make sense. Eh, whatever it is, it didn't really make sense. It wasn't as good as Eli Whitney's flesh-eating mistake, I'll give you that for sure. But since we're talking about Trojan horses and possibly gift horses, you can kind of figure out what era of time we are going to visit. But before we even get there, we have Buck up in his uh, space station kind of showing Otto some of his souvenirs he's collected over the years. And that was just like a fun little aside. It, it lets you know that this guy's been on these adventures for a long time. He's kind of met up with some really important people throughout history, and he's had interactions with them, probably against the code of the Time Squad to be taking artifacts from history and putting it in your, your own personal stash. Like he takes <laughs> Washington's wooden teeth. I have a cute joke about that. He takes uh, King David's slingshot. He takes Galileo's telescope and a bunch of other stuff going on. Yeah. You know who also takes souvenirs? Who do? serial killers yeah exactly like it was a weird <laughs> it was cute because it lets you know he's got a history he's been doing this for a while but it was also weird because it's like this is your job like you're not supposed to just be t- be taking bits and pieces of history back for your own amusement but whatever it sets up a joke at the end of the episode that wasn't super funny yeah but i mean it's if it if it's a a bit or a gag yeah. that they keep up for other episodes. Sure. I'm on board. Sure. I'm on board with Agreed. this. If this is like, if they're setting up this pattern now and it pays off in dividends later, like I'm sign down. me up. Yeah. Yeah. This particular one that was very much just kind of like a rule of three. I think they did. I think they had exactly three of the same gags over and over again. It they rem- did. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I loved every stupid moment of it. It is silly. It is nonsense. Yeah. I, I don't know if I was just in kind of like a nonsense bullshit kind of mood when I watched this show, but it was so silly and stupid. And it's, I love sometimes because I'm accused of this often. Okay. All right. People will say something to me and I will understand and I will hear what they say. But for some reason, my imagination runs wild and I substitute other words. And it's almost like, what did you, it becomes a, what did you think I said situation yes. where I've had to do this with, uh, cause I know you name dropped with, uh, Melanie Harker, friend of the who show. I, who friend of the show, who I'm in a relationship with, 
Uh, <laughs> exactly. And so uh, there are moments where like, she'll see me have that moment where I'm obviously hearing what she said, but I'm thinking of something else. And then she makes me tell her what I said. Yeah. And it's like, who? It's like a weird dark turn into my brain that like nobody really wants to take. No, but... it's like it's like machinery in there that like <laughs> the words go in, but they come out completely different in the space of like two seconds. And you're just like, wow. What? But I feel like but I feel like that's so much of what this cartoon is, yeah. is just people giving advice and people not really hearing what was said right. and then oh yeah, yeah no no don't no, worry no, i got this don't worry no i'll figure it out figure it out crack at it i got this did not did not figure that out did i no all right now we'll do one Good more on time me. one more time what i liked about yeah, this it actually time. reminded me of the old like the classic mary melodies and looney tunes cartoons where a character was trying to do something and then tried to do that thing a few different ways and then it it ended up always failing for a variety of reasons but increasingly like more complicated or if like the best Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner things where he would do one thing, it would fail. So he would do another thing to correct that and it would fail for a different reason. And then by the time he did the third thing, the first reason that it failed would come back and like hit him again. Or, or there was some sort of like follow up that would hit him. It was a nice kind of layered stepwise comedy bit there. Yeah. And I, I think you just helped me realize why I yeah. enjoyed this show so much. I love watching other people fail. And it's not <laughs> like a, it's not like a, a what is it, the, the German Schadenfreude. word? Schadenfreude. It's not a Schadenfreude moment for me. It's really one of those things, because I don't want anybody to actually really fail. But to see that happen, eh, I mean, every once in a while. 45 couple people. people could think, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a few people that I wouldn't mind failing. Uh, but, in, in, but in all honesty, to see failure happen in a cartoon like this so consistently and in such a, a graceful almost like happy manner it's so weird like, you know but it's it, it was so enjoyable to see that though right. like, it, well, it, like we, we've been I'm trying to think people. of other cartoons where that happens we've been teasing the people what's the premise here right. who's trying to do right. a thing and who keeps failing and why uh we've got um you know them and you love them we got the uh we got the greeks <laughs> you know and... you'll love them the greeks the greeks <laughs> Led by, led by Simon. <laughs> yeah, led by Simon. This is a real Greek name. Yeah, Simon. Just so good. That voice, too. I didn't uh, look it up, but that voice was very recognizable, too. I didn't look up who it was. Right. And so uh, we have uh, the Greeks, and they are trying to defeat the Trojans. Right. As you do. And, and as, as history uh, has told mm -hmm. us. And so they are, the Greeks are delivering this Trojan horse statue. And the reason they're doing this, guys, is because if you're not familiar, Greeks are the best gift givers. They are. It's actually like yeah. written into their law. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's uh it's interesting to kind of see how all of this happens. Um, because they they deliver if you're not familiar with the actual Greek and the, the Trojans. Go take um, a history yeah, class. That's the yeah, whole point of this. <laughs> or or be like me and just assume that this cartoon was like fact and history yeah. and just be satisfied or with it. Or just go to Wikipedia. What you're doing. Yeah. And so uh, the whole idea, you know, they had soldiers that were inside of this huge wooden horse. Uh, the Greeks brought it inside of their base. And at night, they unleashed all the soldiers. And they, you know, began a war from the outside where they could actually call in reinforcements because they opened the and gates. They and so they basically burned Troy down. Burned the whole point. fucking yeah. place down. And so uh, this is fun because <laughs> the king, the king gets and receives this Trojan horse, pulls a lever, and all of a sudden, like the butt of it opens up yeah. the horse, and it like poops candy, yeah, like a big wave, all of candy. over the king. And then, and, and they are sitting there watching from behind, and they're just like, Whew. "Does he like it? Does he like the gift? Huh? Is he cool with the gift?" Yeah, because huh? meanwhile, huh? our heroes are standing there, and they're just like, "This is a great idea," but like all the Greek soldiers who were standing around them, they're like, "You guys are supposed to be in the horse. Like, what are you doing?" And Simon's like, "Oh no, it's it's the king's birthday, and I mean, like, I know we've got a war going on and stuff, but." We're really good at giving gifts, and we kind of have to keep I, up that tradition. Yeah, you're missing a part in that justification of why they did it is because they say uh, wars come and go, right. but a birthday, a birthday is an important occasion. Right. And I was just like, oh my god, I, I don't know why that was like that felt like the strong statement out of this portion of the episode where I was like, fuck, like you you gave these guys a great motivation for doing this, regardless of how silly it right. is. So. They should have been inside of that horse's butt that pooped out candy right. 
Instead, they are not. My favorite part, though, is that, like, that's funny enough on its own, but the king doesn't have a sweet tooth. So the king is just like, ugh, candy. And he's like, get rid of it. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's he's been given a bunch of golden cats by, like, <laughs> everybody else in the world. He doesn't like any of this shit. He doesn't like candy. So now Simon has failed not only to launch the, the invasion of the Greek army into Troy, into the walls, um, but he's also failed to, <laughs> to give the king a decent birthday present. So now he's listening to Otto, and he's just like, oh, okay. Got to put soldiers in the horse. Soldiers inside, I yeah. I got it. I'll take care of it. It's all good. So second one, tees up. King gets it, pulls the switch. But it's a what this time? Not a horse. It's a... Trojan giraffe. It was a Trojan giraffe. Yeah. That's right. God damn. <laughs> so Trojan giraffe. They get it. But this guy opens up, and it poops out chocolate soldiers. Right. And so, again, I love the fact that somebody goes... Come on, weren't you paying attention? He hates sweets. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like even if you did, why would you have done even that? Even if you didn't get the soldier thing, like the fact that he hates sweets, and he's like, well, I, I consider chocolate a different thing. <laughs> like, what yeah. a, it's just bizarre. A, yeah. Yeah. So final, final uh, rule of three right. that we have here, which is so great, gets to this point where what is it this time? It's an actual wooden soldier. Yes. So now it's a soldier. So what could possibly be inside of it? And I had no idea where they were going to go either. with this because I was like, I was like, if this is a soldier with other soldiers in it, I was like, that's kind of funny. But they even say like, like when he's outside the gates, there's like a rustle and like a tumbling going on inside, and he's like, "What do you got in there?" And he's like, "No, just yeah. quiet him down. It's fine." And that moment where I was like, "What is in there?" Yep. And when they pull the lever, and it's fucking it's horses. Just full of horses. <laughs> it's but they're they're the, wild the, the, Spanish the, horses. They're wild Spanish horses, <laughs> and which is such a crazy detail yeah. to, to put in there. And these horses completely wreck oh, yeah. and burn and destroy Troy. They're biting everybody. They're setting it the place on fire. So They're causing dumb. havoc. And Simon's like not <laughs> super thrilled about it. He's like, well, we won the war, but it wasn't a great birthday present. My favorite part, though. <laughs> my favorite part. Did you catch this? What? When they were burning bits and pieces of this place down. They a door opens up in one of the like huts that's on fire. Yeah, and two dudes carry a woman out and they run off screen. I was just like, right, that was Helen of Helen of Troy. Yeah, how about that? I was like, that was a cool yeah. thing that they snuck in there that they don't call attention to. But it's like, if you know the story, yeah, there she is and there she goes. I didn't. I didn't. I thought it was just a guy that or two guys that had been doing stuff with one lady. <laughs> well, they probably were at that point. Probably were. Ooh. Yeah. But it was Helen. So yeah, if you know history like Dave, or at least you know yeah, have a cursory or, understanding, or pseudo history because that was all kind know? of like written by Homer and, and yeah. Marge. Um, so yeah, I think <laughs> that was kind of a cute thing. But then the way that they ended it, they're like, "Well, you kind of you know you you fix history not quite the way it was supposed to be, but close enough." And then they're just like, "Time to go." And what does Buck do for his souvenir? Uh, at the very end, Buck leans over to Simon, and you see Simon looking off in like a, a left direction. And from the side of like screen right, you see Buck's hand come over and just grabs his yeah. his helmet, and just <laughs> he goes yoink. Yeah, souvenir. <laughs> That's it. It was super super simple just to have him do that, and then again, just like hard out. That was it. And that was yeah. a, that was a super short one, seven minutes. And it, like I said, it reminded me of the old Looney Tunes, so I thought it was fun. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we've got opinions on this. Uh, do you have anything else from this episode before we jump into recommendations and no? User let's reviews? get into these opinions. What you got out there? Oh man, hey guys, uh, guess what? We obviously have opinions that we just talked about on this show. <laughs> Turns out you, yes, you on the internet also have opinions, and guess what? You love to voice. Them. Yes, you do. <laughs> you felt and so, <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> and so to talk about. Uh, all of these uh, opinions that you guys have, or to take the best of them, we're now going to hand this over to longtime listener and friend of the show, Bobby Anthem, for this week's Love It or Hate It. Bobby, take it away. This week's Love It was written by Danny LaFontaine, 13, on August 24th, 2017. Danny gave the show a rating of 10 out of 10 and titled his review, Time Squad is a Very Good Show. I will be reading it exactly as it was written. Time Squad is a very good show, but it's not for kids. It has lots of sexual innuendo and homosexual innuendo. 
There's an episode where some hippies with red eyes offer the main characters their special brownies. Larry acts like he's drunk in two episodes. And Larry and some presidents go skinny dipping. Then there's some really offensive jokes and stereotypes. With that being said, I think Time Squad is not for kids. And is a very good show for teens and adults. And our hated is really kind of a reformed hated. A former hater named Dudas who wrote this review on October 5th, 2002. He said, forget what I said about this show. Because it's great. I feel that I didn't give this show a chance when I commented on it one year ago today. So I decided to watch more of it. And it sucked me in. It's a really funny show that can't be missed. I love Todd Russell. He's such an idiot. The time traveling can teach you a thing or two in each episode as well. Forget what I said before. This show rules. And I love the fact that Bobby read that all without any punctuation whatsoever. Good job, Bobby. That's amazing. As I've never it should be. I've never heard a sentence without punctuation. This is a first for a lot of us. Look, as much as I love the fact that Bobby does this for us each and every week, he he <laughs> brought to our attention this is the return of Dudas. Yeah, this is the return of Dudas. This was not planned. I did not expect to have two Dudas reviews on this show, but it's the return of Dudas. I never thought I'd say any of those words together in a sentence, but welcome back, Dudas. We're glad to have you. <laughs> too I much guess. Dudas right too now. Too much Dudas. Oh, my gosh. All right, buddy. So what about you? Uh, do you recommend this show? And if not, does it get the dip, meaning it's erased from existence for all time, even though it's a time-traveling show? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, I really, I really enjoyed this show. You know, I was kind of bummed that the theme song really didn't set the tone. Yeah. Uh, but this show just really seems to kind of want to get in there, get to the meat, mm. have some fun with everything. Chew What's on a it. sous vide? Sous vide. Chew up Vacuum that meat. Pack it. Marinate. Mm. What is going on? I love this. Uh, it just it really wants to cut. Uh, to the heart of the show, which is just this silly wackiness of time travel. And I'll be honest with you, there were moments when I, as I'm watching the show, I was like, man, I wish history could have been this cool because I probably would have paid more attention in class to this actual subject matter. So uh, for all of this and these these fun character designs and great fucking voice actors, yep. this is a recommend for me. Yeah, same for me. I think it... It actually could have worked well for like a history class if you played like the seven, 10, 15 minute short and then we're like, okay, that was silly. Everybody had a good time. <laughs> now let's talk about what actually happened and why this was funny or important or, or, you know, have a little history lesson and then play it at the end as a reward and be like, here's the actual history. Here's why this stuff is funny now. And then have a few minutes at the end to just be like, let's talk about what you thought was funny and why. Uh, it's a good way to like reinforce it, but also kind of have fun with it too, which is important because otherwise it's just all dry, dusty stuff and there's no Indiana Jones kind of like adventure aspect to it at all. So I thought it was a lot of fun. Right. The, it was nice, short segments. Uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't tedious. The, the time flew by. I wasn't checking the clock. Um, really funny writing, great voice acting, fun, colorful kind of uh, uh, animation style and everything else too so it's just a solid cartoon like this is what you want when you look for just like a fun cartoon to just watch when you just got some downtime just a lot of fun i don't know how the rest of the episodes stack up the fact that it has you know five annie award nominations it only ran for 26 episodes for whatever reason but it seems like promising and they could have like probably gone a little further with it but not sure what happened but yeah all that to say i recommend it yeah yeah, and a great bonus is that I'm a, I think all of these episodes are available on YouTube. Yeah, it so. seems like a show that just kind of like got lost in time, which is ironic. Um, and yeah. just yeah, Oof. nobody really cared, so it's on YouTube now. Probably because the yeah. world was in turmoil between two thousand one two thousand three, and it's ship shape today, so everything's fine. Time to watch Oof. Time Squad. Yikes! What are you up to out there, brother? Oh man, hey guys! As always, I do live improv comedy in Washington D.C. with a group that is called. Knox, that's N-O-X exclamation point. We perform with Washington Improv Theater. You can check out Tickets and Times, witdc.org. And I'm always on the Turs and the Grams mm. at Sean Paul Ellis. When are we starting up Grampter? Grampter? Combination. Is that your, your, your grandpa Twitter? R.I.P. 
uh, a combination. Grampter. It's Twitter and Instagram for old people. Oh man. Grampter. <laughs> I mean, any day now. I want. I'm. I'm waiting to get seed funding. Perfect. I've been in so many meetings. Uh, with startups and incubators on, on the West Coast. Yeah, we're going to get close. Counting on you. Uh, as for me... And by seed money, I mean they're just going to give me seeds in a pouch and just be like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, I'm totally fine with that also. Because <laughs> guess what? It's a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Yeah. I've read The Grasshopper and the Ant. I know what goes on. <laughs> uh, if you want to talk to me about fables on Twitter, you can find me at DrClawMD. Uh, you can also find me on Collider.com, Nerdist.com, and DaveDrumboard.com. If you want to find out more about this little show right here, we would love it if you'd head to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Saturday Morning Cartoons. Remember, that's morning with a U. You can also find us on SaturdayMorningCartoons.com. Uh, follow along on Twitter at MorningTunes. Check out Sean's handiwork on the aforementioned Instagram page. Keep the lovely conversations going on Facebook and listen to our free audio podcast each and every week through YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. And hey, if you're listening to us on YouTube, we would love it if you'd hit that subscribe button, because YouTube's a bunch of jerks, and we'd appreciate it (laughs) if we could continue to make our small pittance from these episodes each and every week. If you'd like to send us an email, feel free to do so, saturdaymorningcartoons at gmail.com. That's going to wrap it up for this week. If you want to know what we're talking about next week, guess what, bros? That Patreon link I talked about? That's where you're going to find each and every month's newsletter that tells you what cartoons we're going to be doing for the following month. So head on over there and clickety-click and drop a buck. It's good to go. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, they didn't write down who the Twitter user was that told them to to watch the show. But are they organized enough to plan ahead a month in advance? Guys, we're planned ahead all the way through the, (laughs) at least, I don't know, the next like (laughs) four months. Oh, you're doing so good. (laughs) <laughs> all the way through the month of May. I'm not sure if yeah new calendar get on that 13 month yeah we are oh. on SMC we are planned all the way through the actual ending of the world but we're not going to tell you what day that is unless you sign on to our Patreon newsletter and then you'll find oh, out oh man the day we stop doing this show is the day the world ends so stay tuned <laughs> You're making threats like we're the insane clown posse. Just you're, like, insane. you're gonna drop a Joker card, world's gonna end, bro. I'm all right with that. The great uh, Malenko demands it. I can't believe you knew. I'm that. gonna go sip some Fago. Thank you guys so much yeah. for listening. Have a good whatever, and we'll see you next time. Hey everybody! Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.